asking the question this evening, what do you do when you don't know what to do? <clears throat> and Jehoshaphat is going to give us an answer in his prayer to God when at a time when he did not know what to do. Second Chronicles chapter 20 <clears throat> and verse 1. It came to pass, let us stand as, as we read, I'm sorry. If, if you'll just forgive me for one thing, I forget a lot of little things. But standing for the word is good. Amen. Chapter 20, verse 1. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria, and behold, they be in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together <coughs> to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein. And have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If, when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given to in us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company, that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Amen. You may be Amen. seated. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you would minister this word to the need of our hearts. As you have moved us to pray this evening about prayer, you have moved our pastor to uh, read from Ian e. Bounds in the staff prayer meetings and to read in uh, Mr. Brooks' work and also in Mr. Cobbett's work. And now moving him to, to share with us from the scriptures on prayer and moving my heart and, and even with all of the <clears throat> the way in which I believe the evil one has tried to attack me on this message. Lord, we need to hear from you. We need your encouragement. We need, we need you to speak into our hearts that we would be men and women of prayer. And at such a time as this, we ask that you would help us. Lord, as, as has been prayed, Lord, let it not be a lecture. It's not a lecture. It's just a simple man preaching a simple message from a mighty book. We ask that you would speak to us yes. and minister to us in the need of our hearts yes, yes, for Christ's sake. Amen. 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 I want to be an encouragement to you this evening in your praying. 
and in your prayer life, as we call it. I believe that if we ever needed to pray, this is the hour. Amen. If we ever needed to pray, this is the hour. Have, have you ever lived a year out where there have been so many deaths? Have, have you ever seen so much sickness and so many people passing on? Have you ever been at a time in history where you no longer trust the news media as you trusted them before? Has there ever been a time when you began to wonder if, if the Constitution of the United States is going to be put aside totally? Has there ever been a time in our lives where, where we were inundated with with such grotesque ideas about sexuality and about LGBTQ and all of those other um, words that they put together there? Ha has there ever been a time where <clears throat> we felt such a need for God to do something? There are, there are individuals in this church who are going through great physical turmoil, and they need our prayers. There are things happening in our nation where we're being threatened with pandemics, starvation, and, and homelessness, and you name it. Those things are being talked about. Those things are being put forth, and we have seen some of it already happen, and we need to pray. Well, Jehoshaphat was a man <coughs> who in chapter 20 and verse 12 said, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. What do we do when we don't know what to do? What do we do? When we have no strength, no power, and only ignorance in ourselves, what do we do? Well, <coughs> Jehoshaphat tells us what we need to do because he says in verse 12, but our eyes are upon thee. And in this whole prayer, Jehoshaphat is telling us what to do because Jehoshaphat is telling us we need to be a a people of prayer. We need in this day and hour to be an, a people of prayer. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. He set before us in scripture as a godly king. He was a godly king in the eyes of God himself. In chapter 17 and verse 3, it says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not unto Balaam but sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. Here is a godly king in the midst of ungodliness. His father David was a godly man and he's following in the footsteps of David. His father Asa was a godly man and very young and lived a very short life. <coughs> And, and turned away from the Lord to some degree in his later years because he sought unto the physicians when he was diseased in his feet, and he didn't seek the Lord. And here Jehoshaphat has become the king of, of Judah. And Ahab, the wicked king Ahab, is the king of Israel. But Jehoshaphat is a godly king. And in verse 5, it says, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. And all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents, and he had riches and honor in abundance. And usually when you have riches and honor, you, <coughs> you become more uh, prone to pride and more prone to be lifted up in pride and to think you're someone. But notice what it says in verse 6, And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord not in the ways of riches and self. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. Amen. 
And what that's talking about is that he's doing away with idolatry. He is putting idolatry out of the land of Judah. And although later in, in, in the account of his life, <clears throat> we see that the high places were not totally taken away, that was either because there were some high places that had been left for Jehovah or possibly that the people themselves who were not following the king wholeheartedly had left some of those high places. But he was a godly king in the eyes of God. He, in chapter 17, I won't, I won't read it all, but he saw that there was a need for teaching throughout Judah. <clears throat> and this is an amazing thing in the life of this king. So he sent Levites to teach the law of the Lord throughout the land. What a glorious king we have here. No wonder the people brought him presents because he was teaching them the law of God. He was sending the Levites. He was appointing men who could teach and princes who could, who could um, allow these Levites to teach. And they went throughout the land and taught the law of the Lord. And so the people were being fed. The people were being enlightened as to their own covenant with the covenant-keeping God who had brought them out of bondage in Egypt. It says in chapter 17, verse 10, And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were round about Judah, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. There was a great fear from God that fell upon the kingdoms around them. And the, and the nations around Judah left Judah alone because they had a godly king. They had a king who... Who, was, uh, who had the Lord with him, and he walked in the ways of his father, and God blessed him, and his kingdom was established. And it was established because of that righteous, godly walk of the king with his God and what he was teaching the people, and the Lord blessed them. So the fear of the Lord was, was upon the, the nations around, and they had peace. And then <coughs> Judah became prosperous and strong, in verse 12, it says, And Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly, and he built in Judah castles and cities of store. <clears throat> and verse 13, And he had much business in the cities of Judah, and the men of war, mighty men of valor, were in Jerusalem. And if we were to read the whole account and add all the, the numbers together of the soldiers in his army, I think Matthew Henry said there were 1,200,000 soldiers in his army. And then it's a little bit open-ended because there were also more. Um, and it says in verse 19 that these waited on the king beside those whom the king put in the fence cities throughout all Judah. So there were even more than 1, 200, almost 200,000 soldiers. And so it was a mighty nation, and God blessed them because they were walking with God. But Jehoshaphat, was, though he was a good man, <clears throat> he followed the practice of, of marrying one of his children, one of his sons, with one of Ahab's daughters. And he developed a friendship with Ahab. And God was not pleased with his friendship with Ahab. And so it was that he, he went to be with Ahab uh, for, for a short season, and Ahab wined him and dined him with, with a lot of meat, and they had a great feast. And then Ahab invited <coughs> Jehoshaphat to join him in battle against Ramoth Gilead. And Jehoshaphat said, my people are as your people. And they went to battle together. Of course, there were, there, it, Jehoshaphat wanted to call the prophets. And so Ahab called all of his prophets together. I think there were something like 400 of them. And they put horns on their heads. And they, they said, you're going to defeat the enemy. And then after it's all over, all of the, the prophets of Ahab have spoken. Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord whom we can hear? And so it was that Micaiah was called 
And Ahab didn't want him to come because he was the kind of prophet who spoke evil of Ahab every time. And so he came, and <clears throat> that lying spirit that had been put in the other prophets, Micaiah, went along with them. And then Ahab said, how many times do I have to tell you to t when you prophesy to tell me the truth? I'm just paraphrasing. Tell me the truth about it. And he began to tell him the truth. And he told Ahab that Ahab was going to die in the battle, which is what happened. So they went out to battle, and Jehoshaphat was mistaken for Ahab. He cried out, and the Lord helped him. Even though this good man was doing something he shouldn't have been doing, he cried out, and the Lord helped him. And Ahab, someone took a bow and at a venture shot an arrow, and it hit Ahab and killed him. And Micaiah's prophecy came true. And so here we have a good man, although he has a flaw, there is something wrong in his life. And so it was that another prophet came <coughs> to, to speak to Jehoshaphat. And it says in chapter 19, And Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem, and Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. And again, we see more. Where, where Jehoshaphat is setting up judges and doing good things. And, and this is not tongue-in-cheek. Jehoshaphat was a godly king who had flaws in his life. I think it's important to see that because even in the church today, we realize that we are imperfect human beings. But God hears Jehoshaphat when he cries out to him. I'm not saying that we need to excuse um, sin in our lives. I'm not saying that we need to have great flaws in our lives. I'm not saying that we need to align ourselves with the ungodly. But we are living in a day and time when the church has aligned itself with the ungodly. The church has allowed the world to come in. And if the church cries out to God and the church repents of her sins, God is going to hear her and God is going to bless her. And that is where we need to begin. May God bless us to see that. May God give us eyes to see that he will bless his people who will call out to him. And so Jehoshaphat went on to do more good. But that holy alliance with Ahab continues to plague him and his offspring. <clears throat> well, we see in, in chapter 20 that a situation arises where God is going to deal with Jehoshaphat, and God is going to work in his life. God is going to do something in Jehoshaphat's life because he loves him, and he's going to chasten him. <clears throat> Now, we had read earlier that the Lord um, protected the land and that the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were round about Judah. But when Jehoshaphat goes and joins the wicked in battle, God takes that hand of protection off of Judah. And so we read in chapter 20, verse 1, And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon with, and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. <clears throat> Those are three great nations, three great and powerful nations. We don't realize it from reading the text immediately, but if we think about it, we can see that this is a, a tremendous army of soldiers. <clears throat> one, thing, one thing we do see is that this is three nations against one because it's the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites against the one nation of Judah. <clears throat> we also realize that 
Jehoshaphat has over a million soldiers. And in the end of it all, when Jehoshaphat's army goes to take spoil from, from these dead soldiers that have died out on the battlefield that God destroys, that the people couldn't, the soldiers couldn't even carry all that was there, and it took them three days to get the spoil. And so I wonder if maybe the army of the Moabites the Ammonites and the Edomites was perhaps three times larger than one million. I don't know. But I know it was large. And I also know that <coughs> in verse 2 it says, There came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee <coughs> from beyond the sea on this side Syria, and behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And if you look on the map in your Bible, at least it looked this way to me, it's about 20 miles away from Jerusalem where Jehoshaphat is. It's no wonder the Bible tells us in verse 3, and Jehoshaphat feared. Jehoshaphat feared. <clears throat> Sometimes fear is a good thing. When God moves our hearts with fear, it's a good thing. Do you know it was a good thing for Noah to be moved by fear and to prepare an ark? And it's good for Jehoshaphat that God has come into his life and Jehoshaphat has disobeyed God. Jehoshaphat has disobeyed the word of God and he's the one who knows the law of God and he's the one who sent the Levites to teach the law of God and Je Jehoshaphat aligned himself with the wicked and now God is dealing with Jehoshaphat and he feared but Joshua, Jehoshaphat did more than fear the Lord. He did that which was right and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. That's a glorious um, a glorious gathering of the Lord's people. Here, here is this godly king who has a flaw and who has done wrong, and God is dealing with him and with the nation because of sin in the nation, and here the nation has gathered. Oh, to God that, that the, we wish that the church could gather together and that we could join hands one with another as churches and pray together for this land. Oh, how we need prayer. I don't know about you, but I'm not hearing a lot about prayer in, in what I'm reading. I, I, I come across uh, articles on, on how to prep for what's coming up ahead of us, and I don't hear them telling me that I need to pray. I read one article where a Jewish lady said we need to pray, and that more and more she senses the need for prayer. And what a rebuke to us. We need to pray. And oh, that the churches would gather together to pray, even as Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast, and all Judah gathered together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. This, this is massive. There is this gigantic army of trained soldiers. Jehoshaphat's army hasn't really been practicing battle exercises <laughs> These guys have been in battle. These guys are coming. They're 20 miles away. They're larger in size than, than the army that Jehoshaphat has, even though he has a million soldiers. And they are so great in size that they can't even gather all of the spoil when they go. And now all of Judah is coming together in Jerusalem to the house of the Lord to pray. Are you in a situation in your life where you do not know what to do? Are you in a situation in your life where you're wondering what you should do? Perhaps there's a decision you need to make or something that you desire in your life and, and it seems like that the fulfillment of that desire is something insurmountable. Perhaps a person 
who has chosen to be your enemy is troubling you like Jehoshaphat. Perhaps an uncertain future is threatening you and you can't control it. A sickness or an affliction that you can't <coughs> understand or resolve or cure. What does a person do when they don't know what to do? What do we do when we have no, we're ignorant of what we should do? Jehoshaphat was in that place. He realized that he did not have the power, the resources, or the strength to overcome the great multitude coming against him. And you do not have the strength in yourself to overcome the difficulties of your life. You do not have the strength to overcome the world on your own. You do not have the strength to overcome the flesh on your own. Can anyone say amen? Amen. 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 I can't overcome my flesh in my own power. You have no strength in yourself to overcome the devil and don't try to take him on face to face with your own power because he is a powerful, experienced foe of all believers. You have no power in and of yourself to overcome. We do not have the power in ourselves to overcome our present conflict as a nation. We, I don't know how you have felt, but at times I've felt so frustrated. What can I do? What can I do with all of this happening around me? I'm thinking of my children and my grandchildren, and I'm thinking about all of the evil that's being perpetrated upon God's people. More than ever in our lives, we're faced with opposition to our freedom and our peace and our families and our way of life, threatened with servitude, slavery, theft of property, loss of freedom of worship, poverty, forced relocation, bombardment with immoral philosophies and practices, a tearing down of moral foundations, the basic laws of life and liberty, the social order of righteous peacemaking government, all of it is being threatened in our day. I don't believe I'm exaggerating anything. We, we see these things and we know these things are happening and and sometimes we wonder, have I lost my sanity? Is this really happening? Am I going to wake up one of these days and, and, and awaken to the reality that it was all a bad dream and everything's okay and I can go on? No, it's happening and it's worldwide. It's happening all around the world today. I'm not trying to frighten the young people, but I'm saying that we as God's people need to gather together to pray because we're powerless in ourselves. We're powerless in ourselves to revive the churches in our day. Are you with me? We are powerless to revive the churches in our day. <clears throat> We're watching before our very eyes as the earthly powers attempt to take away our freedoms <clears throat> that our Constitution has safeguarded. But worse than that is the spiritual declension in the churches of our day. Worse than that is the fact that all around us, churches are closing and pastors are leaving, and there is a declension in the churches in our day. Strange powers and forces are working in our day that we, along with Jehosh Jehoshaphat, cannot overcome in our feeble efforts. What do we do when we don't know what to do? What do we do when we do not know what we should do? Jehoshaphat shows us the way, and he finds great blessing from the Lord. Jehoshaphat is an imperfect man, and, and I'm saying this because we are imperfect people. And he sinned, but he cried out to God, and God heard him. <clears throat> does he resign himself? What does he do? Does he resign himself to destruction? Does he say, well, let come co what may come? No. Does he lean upon the arm of flesh? He has an army of over one million. No, he doesn't lean upon the arm of flesh. His army is not his confidence. Does he seek after carnal wisdom? No, he doesn't. In fact, wonderfully, he acts upon his own. And he acts as a man after God's own heart 
and he prays. What does he do when he does not know what to do? Well, he fears. He sets himself to seek the Lord. He proclaims a nationwide fast, and the people of God gathered to the house of God, and he stood and he prayed. What a king and what a prayer. What a king was Jehoshaphat, and what a prayer he prayed. <clears throat> what a glorious prayer. <clears throat> Verses 6 through 11 in chapter 20 in Jehoshaphat's prayer. Verses 6 through 11 are all holy worship and holy reasonings and holy arguments based on the word and against the enemy <clears throat> who are repaying evil for good. He hasn't asked anything in verses 6 through 11, but he's preparing to ask. And he is crying out to his God in holy worship. And so look, look with me at verses 6 through 11. <clears throat> he stood, in verse 5, in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And in verse 6 it says, And, and he said, O Lord God of our fathers, Art not thou God in heaven? And so he is remembering that God is the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He's remembering that he is in a relationship with the covenant God who historically has saved his people out of bondage. Art, thou not, art not thou the God in heaven? Aren't you the one who rules over all? You are the singular monarch of the universe, you are the God who rules in heaven. And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen. <clears throat> we need to pray like this. We need to pray as Jehoshaphat prayed, re recognizing, I, I think of the Lord's prayer, our Father which art in heaven, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? Yes, he rules over all. And Jehoshaphat realizes that he's standing before hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, and he's praying this prayer standing. What a king and what a prayer. And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none are, with a are able to withstand thee? God, you have the power that is needful in this hour of our crisis. God has the power right now, and this is the way you need to pray. Oh, God, are you not the God who has power and might so that no one <coughs> is able to withstand you? Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever. What is Jehoshaphat doing? Jehoshaphat is rehearsing in his mind before God all that God has done and how that God drove out <coughs> all the, the nations in the land of Canaan and gave it to the seed of Abraham, his friend, forever. He was one of the sons of Abraham. And they dwelt therein <coughs> and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name. And then he re recalls a promise. He's not asking yet. He is asking, but he's not giving the full, the full asking. But he's, <coughs> he's remembering God's promises. If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine... We stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction. Then thou wilt hear and help. Then thou wilt hear and help. He's reciting the promises of God. God says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. <clears throat> call unto me, and I will answer thee. Did you know that Right before that, God was promising blessing to his people. And just after that verse, God was promising blessing to his people. 
and he says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And this is what Jehoshaphat is doing. He's crying out to God in his affliction and rehearsing in his own mind and before God the promises of God, that God would bless his people when they cry out to him. And then he says, And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. Jehoshaphat is giving holy reasons to a holy God about the injustice of Moab and Ammon and Seir being passed over by God when Israel inherited the land and they did not cast them out. And now what are Moab and and Ammon and Edom doing (coughs) but turning against the people of God who spared them? And so he says, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? because of their injustice. And then he says, for we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Our eyes are upon thee. And so Jehoshaphat prays in verse 12 for judgment on those who are coming against him. And Jehoshaphat is admitting his impotence, his powerlessness. He has no power, and his people have no power against this great army. Jehoshaphat admits his ignorance. We should admit our impotence before God, our powerlessness, and our ignorance. And then the Bible tells us, but our eyes are upon thee. What do we do when we don't know what to do? We turn our eyes to the Lord. We look upward. We lift up our eyes to him. How can we describe Jehoshaphat's eyes, those eyes with which he looked up to heaven? They were eyes of humble submission. They were eyes of very humble submission, admitting ignorance and impotence. They were eyes of desperate dependency because there are three nations who are prepared 20 miles away. Who knows how large this company is? A great multitude. They were eyes of intense desire. And as Spurgeon says, we should not come before the Lord our God half-heartedly but with strong desires. And God will hear us. It is a secret in prayer. They were eyes of expectation and hope based on Scripture, God's character, and his past works. Jehoshaphat expected his God to work. Based on Scripture, based on God's character, and based on his past works. They were eyes of trust in the power of the sovereign God of heaven. That's the first thing he mentions is the sovereignty of of his God. Jehoshaphat said, but our eyes are upon thee. Amen. I ask you tonight, where are your eyes? Where are your eyes? Where where are our eyes in the midst of all that is happening in our lives personally, as a church, as a nation? Where are our eyes? When we are indifferent to God's commands and appeals to pray, he brings us to impossible situations where we must pray. And I believe God is doing that in our lives today. I don't believe my prayer life has been what it should be. And I believe God is teaching me to pray. I believe that God is mercifully giving me very good teaching on prayer, and I thank God for that. I believe, and I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I believe that most of us, if not all of us, 
are in need of improvement in our prayer lives. And I believe it's a part of, <coughs> of our day of turning on light switches and, and, and microwaves and, and everything happening so immediately. We don't have the patience to sit down, get down on our knees, and cry out to God for hours in prayer. And we need God's grace. Amen. Whom the Lord loves, he chastened, chastens. He loved Jehoshaphat. He loved him, and he chastened him in love. When the Lord, whom the Lord loves, <coughs> he chastens, and they love him for it after he chastens them. A child turns his eyes to his father when he's chastened in love. <coughs> I would chasten my children when they were younger, and they would come and cling to me and want to be with me. You would think it'd be the opposite. You're, you're disciplining your child. You would think that they would be, they would go away, but I discovered they like you. They want to be with you. They want to please you. What a glorious thing that is when God's people turn to him in their chastening. Amen. And they begin to look up and to pray as they ought to pray. There's a great injustice in our land. We need to have our eyes fixed upon the Lord. What shall we look at specifically when we turn our eyes to the Lord? What shall we behold? What shall we look at? What shall we see when we turn our eyes to the Lord? Let our eyes be upon his strength. That's where Jehoshaphat turned his eyes, to the strength of his God. <coughs> O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen, and in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Let our eyes be upon <coughs> the strength of the Lord. There is nothing too hard for our God. There is nothing that our God cannot do. He is omnipotent. He has all power. He created all things, all of this universe, this whole world. He created with the spoken word, and someday he will fold it all up and burn everything with fire, and he will usher in the new heavens and the new earth. Our God has all power. And we need to believe that when we call upon him. Let our eyes be upon his promises. <clears throat> I mentioned Jeremiah 33, 3. It's a good place to begin. Call unto me. God commands you to call unto him. Tell him so. Oh, God, you've, you've commanded me to call upon you. You, have, you. you tell me to come boldly to the throne of grace. Tell him so. Oh, my God, I've come to you because you command me to come. I come at your blessed call and invitation. I know I'm not being presumptuous. I know I have the warrant to come because you said, call unto me. Let our eyes be upon that promise. He said, and I will answer thee. O oh God, we, we can pray. I have come to call unto you in answer to your summons, and you have promised to answer me. I will answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And in the context of these verses, God is promising to return his people from captivity and to restore them before the verse and after it. And I believe that we can co-join Jeremiah 33, 3 <coughs> with any promise God makes to his new covenant people. And you can be sure he will show you great and mighty things. God will show you great and mighty things. If you will call unto him, he will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Let our eyes be upon his unchanging faithfulness. Let our eyes be upon his unchangingness. He is immutable. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. Everything is changing around us. We are changing as the days go by. Our circumstances are changing. The world around us is changing. The church is changing. Our families are changing. Our health is changing. 
but God is unchanging. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. And let us recite his faithfulness in our prayers. Let our eyes <coughs> be upon his loving kindness and his past mercies, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Remember that God loves his people when you go before him. So Jehoshaphat called Judah to fast and to pray. Our pastor has been encouraging us to pray. Pastor, don't give up. Keep encouraging us. Amen. Keep on urging us on. Keep on reading those books. Keep on, on reading those scriptures. And let us encourage one another. Amen. Let us be a people of prayer. Mount Zion's literature ministry is a ministry built and sustained on prayer. Let's keep that going. <clears throat> there have been terrible hard times in the past in this ministry, and God has heard and answered prayer. And back in the, if, correct me if I'm wrong, back in the 90s, my family was here, and <clears throat> Brother Snyder, um, the, the men were praying. The, the staff was not being paid. The, um, the ministry was not going forward, and the bills were not paid. And they prayed, and I watched them do it. And a check came in, and Brother Snyder gave me the check, or he gave me a check written on that check, and sent me to pay a power bill <laughs> with that check. Amen. And that was a blessing to me. I thought, wow, I'm a part of this. This is a great thing. We're at a time when we're facing great trials ahead of us. Let's prepare by praying now. Amen. Should we wait until we're overwhelmed? No. We should pray importunately now. How is your prayer life? How is your prayer time with the Lord? Is it hot or cold, or is it lukewarm? In 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 13, it says, And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. All Judah, that's the men. The men were there. <clears throat> and as men, we are ex especially exhorted to pray. <clears throat> I will that men pray everywhere, Paul said. That men pray, that's generic. Men pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And I think men are exhorted to pray often in Scripture because men are so reluctant to pray, because we as men are so self-sufficient and we think we're strong and we think we can handle our problems, but we need to learn to pray. All Judah was there with their wives. <coughs> their wives were there fasting and praying with their husbands. Ladies, you need to pray. You need to be women of prayer. And their children, the children were there fasting and praying. Younger people, you need to learn to pray. You need to learn to pray. What do we do when we lack the wisdom to know what to do? James tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. He won't scold you. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think <coughs> that he shall receive <coughs> anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If any of you lack wisdom is just another way of saying when you do not know what to do. Amen. James tells us to pray. What do we do when we need great mercy? I'm just going to read Psalm 123. It's very short. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants <clears throat> look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt. 
of the proud. I repeat Jehoshaphat's petition in verse 12. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Jehoshaphat. We thank you, Father, for his beautiful prayer that that you moved his heart to pray. And Father, how we pray that we would learn from Jehoshaphat what we need to do when we do not know what to do, and that you would give us grace (coughs) to be a people of prayer. Father, forgive us for where we have fallen short, for where we have not prayed as we ought. Father, we need the working of your Spirit in our prayer lives, and we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let us stand together. (coughs) The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace. Amen. Amen.